Y'all keep sitting on that back wall. I'm taking them chairs away. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Remember that a couple weeks ago? Great gospel verse, isn't it? That's the gospel. And that's a reminder that Paul was helping the church and helping Timothy to be reminded about. Don't forget what it's all about. Don't forget, don't forget where your roots are, where you come from, and what is to, to anchor you to. Uh, I love, as you see Paul in his ministry experience progress, I love how he boils the gospel down. It just gets simpler and simpler. You know, some people... <laughs> It just gets more and more complicated. You know, you you got saved and you thought it was easy, but then you found out, you know, but you have to, but and this and that. And did you tell them about repentance? And did you tell them about? Uh, did you tell them about? Uh, you know how that they they you know need to show fruit? And did you tell them about? And they just add and add and add and add things to to the gospel. And Paul, as he grew. In his faith, and as as he grew spiritually, he, it just got simpler, simpler, simpler. Remember that Christ Jesus was raised, or Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, uh, according to my. Or Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel. That's it. Remember that, Timothy. That ought to anchor you, and that ought to help you remember first of all what it's all about, and remember what isn't the gospel, and that's anything else. Anything else? So you, you start to hear. Uh, someone preaching or sharing the gospel, and uh, it gets more complicated than that. You better look out. You better look out. Okay, here we are in chapter two of Second Timothy, and uh, we're going to go down to verse fifteen. And uh, matter of fact, we probably a lot of us know this song. How many of y'all know how to know this verse as a song? Study shall I self approve <coughs> unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly but dividing the word of truth. Let's let's sing it together and let's do uh, men and ladies parts. Do it uh, the complimenting. You guys know how that goes? Yeah. What's that? Oh, you don't even know this song? For shame! How can you be a kids worker and not know this song? Okay, so it goes: Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, a little bit higher than that. But as soon as you go study shall I self approved unto God, then the second group starts. The ladies start. Okay, so we start with the men. Study to show thyself self approved unto God. And the ladies. Okay, so we're going to do it. Ready? Here we go. Study, study to show thyself self approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. They're like chanting it like Catholics, aren't they? They're like, da 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 Okay, let's all sing it together, and then we'll split our parts. Okay, here we go. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's try it again. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not that hard. Except you all kind of drag out that last part differently than I'm used to. For me, it's word of truth. And that's it. Not word of truth. It's not like that. Okay. It's word of truth. Okay, here we go. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Man, we still got some enchanters there at the end. All right, now let's try ladies first and then men. Okay, ladies, you ready? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A word that the needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm just really sorry that y'all don't think that's such an awesome song, but it's a verse in the Bible, so haters going to hate as they say. All right, let's read our text. Verse 15, study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Father, please help us tonight as we look at the Scripture to see problems, doctrinal problems, problems in the church, and then see the solutions for them. And I pray that the practicality of it would hit home for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I, I do appreciate the Apostle Paul's willingness to name names. Everyone that was reading this letter, which was written for Timothy and for the church, knew who Hymenius and Alexander were. We don't really know uh, if this is Alexander the coppersmith or... Uh, whether, you know, we don't know a lot of detail, a lot of information about these men, and actually they're not significant as individuals. What's significant about them is what they represent, which is a problem doctrinally or problems in the church. And so in our text this evening, we're going to just see uh, a common theme that Paul actually, uh, throughout this personal letter that he writes to the young pastor Timothy, mentions over and over, but I do want at the outset just, just remind you about a couple of things. I haven't uh, said very much lately, but uh, if as in Jude or as in other epistles, we as believers are to contend for the faith, uh, I just want us to know some things. You don't, That does not mean that you need to be nasty or that you need to respond in kind to people who are wrong, but you will seem to be contentious if you contend. And I think we ought to just be reminded about that. You know, sometimes, did, did you all spend as much time listening to the hearings last week as I did? I was upset about that. I listened to everything pretty much that Congress had to say last week and everything that was said by different individuals. Did you all notice that one of the things they said about, uh, about the judge was that he didn't have the temperament to be a judge when they accused him of being a serial rapist and he was offended by it? And, you know, that, that was a, this a, actually was a ridiculous, it was an absolute a ridiculous um, notion that you should be able to say things that oughtn't to be said about someone and that you can just bring libelous accusations without corroboration and um, that they shouldn't be offended by it. <laughs> uh, it's helped me know how he should have responded. You know, some people say, well, you know, because he's a conservative and he doesn't believe in chopping up babies and murdering them, he should have responded by, you know, quitting the world. I mean, that's, that would have satisfied people, right? If, if uh, he'd eliminated himself or at least maybe jumped in one of Tesla's roadsters and gotten launched into outer space or something like that and never came back, maybe that would have been all right. Uh, you know, I'm just, just giving you nutty stuff that he could have done. What would have satisfied people? Well, for him to remove himself from the world would satisfy people that don't agree with saying that it's wrong to murder babies. I mean, honestly, that's what that's what it came down to. That's what the deal was. We want to murder babies. And if you don't think murdering babies is okay, then we're going to do anything, any libelous, slanderous thing. And that's what it comes down to. Now, you know, I'm not trying to make a political commentary this evening. This really isn't about politics. It's, for example... And I think it's a good example for thinking people. And I hope we are thinking people. I hope we have minds. And I, 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 I don't think that we need to be uh, using shock or using nastiness in personality to respond to things. I, I don't, I, that's, that's not what I'm, what I'm arguing for this evening. But I do think that right never seems um, palatable to people who are wrong. And I promise you, if you were Hymenius and Alexander, they were instantly firing off letters and having whispered secret conversations with people about the nasty temperament of the Apostle Paul calling them out in a public letter for their subversive false doctrine that was destroying people's lives. Which is precisely what was happening in the church. And so Paul called them out by name. And sometimes it, it, just, it just needs to be done. Sometimes things ought to be said. Sometimes politeness... Is not uh, is not the is not the right way to handle things in, in the sense of actually politeness is always right, but sometimes it isn't polite to not deal with things. Sometimes we think that just you know not dealing with a problem is polite. It isn't. It's cowardly. Is actually what it is. 
And so I appreciate this about the Apostle Paul. Now I remind you, he's not very popular. I remind you that among believers, this individual who you and I, if we were to ask the question of who the most influential Christian in the first century was, I think he'd get our unanimous vote. What you say? Who's the most influential Christian in our century? I'll ask that question. Who's the most influential Christian in our century? The Apostle Paul. How about last century? I mean... The most greatly used Christian in the church age is the Apostle Paul, and he wasn't popular. I'll just remind you about that. And I want to look at some of the things that uh, the Apostle Paul was urging Timothy to do and the, the manner in which he was doing it. He was identifying problems within the church. And the first problem, he said, study and show thyself approved unto God. Of course, uh, this is a great verse for kids in school, but that's not really the context. Kids, school's bad. And it's no fun and never will be. It's just necessary, so just suck it up and go. Um, that's all i got to say about school. That, this isn't in concept. If, you're, if uh, you know, your teachers are saying, study to show thyself approved unto God when you're you know, zoning out in La La Land. No, just obey. Just do what you're supposed to do. Uh, but this has a context. In other words, make it a study of your life to show yourself approved unto God. That's what it means. Right? It's not saying, go to school to show thyself approved unto God. No, it's saying, make it a study to be approved of God. In other words, God, are you satisfied or do you approve? God, do you approve of my life? In other words, study for God's approval in your life. You see that? That's what Paul's telling Timothy. Timothy, you need to be aware of an individual who is constantly watching, who is ever aware, and you need to study to make sure that he approves. Here, here is a reference, to, of course, to the omnipresence of God. This is Paul reminding Timothy, God's watching, and God is the one who ultimately is sitting in the judgment seat. You know the difference between the judgment seat and the great white throne judgment? The judgment seat is where God rewards believers for living for Him. And uh, man, when you come up to the judgment seat and, and uh, Jesus is sitting there, you want to get that laurel, you know, that, that, that crown, you want to get that approval from the Lord Jesus, and it needs to be your study to do so, and instantly after that, Paul launches into a, I won't say tirade, but he launches into a very, very visceral, very, very literal outlining of problems and problem people in the church and the solutions to the problems. And I just want to look at some of those this evening, okay? So that's the text. You say, Pastor, I don't like it very much the way you're presenting it. Well, uh, Paul's the most popular guy in the last 2,000 years, maybe I'll be popular after I'm dead too, so, you know, <laughs> I'm getting closer every day, so, well, as I said earlier, suck it up and get used to it or whatever, <laughs> I, I have right after I said, don't be obnoxious, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, when I was in uh, college, I think it was my senior year, there was a guy uh, he was a speech major, and I don't know what it is about speech majors in general and speech people in general, but they just tend, uh, they, how many of y'all went to school with speech majors? Okay, y'all y'all think of the stereotypes, I'm about to fall off, that's because I'm 40 now, because I'm talking about speech majors. Alright, uh, y'all y'all know what the stereotypes about speech majors, right? They're really good about talking about nothing. In other words, I don't know what it is, but speech majors think they're intellectuals. I used to question when I was in college, I used to think, what are they here for? And what do they want to accomplish? Why do you go to college to major in speech? And I'd ask speech majors, so what do you, are you going to you know, be an actor or actress? Are you going to, you know, they say, no, you know, I'm thinking about going into politics or I'm thinking about going into business. And, what does that have to do with being a speech major? Well, I want to be able to be well-spoken. But don't you need to know something to speak about? You know, don't you have, need to have a knowledge base? You know, that's always what I thought. You know, learn something and then figure out how to communicate what you've learned. But no, just learn how to communicate. <laughs> and uh, and that this is this is the these are the people here. Okay, so there's a speech major. I won't tell you his name. Uh, today, Brother Dunford used the name Johnny, and I think that's mean to Johnnies everywhere, even though they almost always fit the stereotype. <laughs> but it's Johnnies and Sallies won't use so. So we'll just call this um, uh, Sally John. How about that, Sally John? Okay, so this guy by the name of Sally John he is sitting at the table, and he comes in and he asks one of the stupid. Uh, did I say stupid? Yeah. Kids, don't say stupid. Don't say that. That's pastoral privilege. 
Okay, if you get called to the ministry and you become a pastor, it's it's a pastor only word. Okay, so don't say dumb, don't say stupid. They're not. They usually don't have nice contacts, and so you have to be nice all the time. Unless you're a pastor, it's wrong. Okay, but anyway, so we asked a stupid question. And the question was, you know, one one of these ones like, you know, can God make a rock so big he cannot, you know, he can't move it, or how many angels can stand on the head of a pen? You know, those kind of stupid questions. You know, and he asked me, and I said, well, you know, he asked me a question. It wasn't that question. It was one he was just sitting there pondering life and came up with as he's thinking about hypothetical things about God and wondering something about God. Instead of going to his Bible and learning about God, he's just trying to think up in his mind about God and then come up with an answer for his question that he thought up about God. And he asked me the question. I said, that's a dumb question. I was going to be a pastor, so I was allowed to say that. I was studying for the ministry, so I was practicing saying that. It's, just a, it's a dumb question. I said, it's hypothetical. There's no way you can know the answer to it, first of all. And second of all, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have any point. You know, you just, it's, just, it's all about your intellect and you thinking you're so smart about thinking up something and then thinking up the same answer to it and just thinking about something entirely hypothetical. What a waste of life. Now, I mean, uh, by the way, try to minimize the hypothetical. Sometimes it's nice to just to think about God. Uh, but just thinking of things like, you know, you get mad at people over things they might say. Well, if they say this to me, I don't say, well, they never said that. You're just thinking they might say it to you. You're mad at them and it hasn't even happened. You know, there's just so much that happens when people think of things. You know, I think they might think, well, stop thinking that. Just just go on the facts. Live on the facts, on a factual basis. You'll be one of those people. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a terrible way to live. Well, Paul was mentioning a couple of these guys, Hymenaeus and Alexander, and he called them, you think I mean, he said, shun profane and vain babblings. Now, the word vain means empty or useless. Don't tell me that's nice. Babbling. Uh, now, babbling is wonderful if it's a brook, but babbling is not wonderful if it's a person. You know, a, a brook babbles, the water blah, 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 goes up. But when somebody's babbling when they're talking, you know, it's an onomatopoeia. It's a word that sounds like, you know, what it sounds, you know, it sounds like what it means. It just means that you're going boom, 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 when you're talking, which means that you're not making very much sense. Or that you don't have very much content or direction or purpose. In other words, you're a speech major. And so... <laughs> and here's what happens with vain babblings. Paul said they just get worse. Hey, vain means empty or useless. Babbling means boom, 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 boom. Okay? So that, there you go. And then he said they will increase unto more ungodliness. He said it just it just grows. The nonsense grows. And he said their word will eat us doth canker doth a canker. Now don't tell me canker's a nice word either. Canker's an open, rotting, festering sore or wound. You ever see an open, rotting, festering wound or, uh, or sore, you know? Uh, something that's so rotten that it actually reeks and it's literally a person who's alive who a part of them is dying or rotting. It's disgusting. And so this is Paul's description. Buh, 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 uh, vain, empty, useless, rotting, festering sore. I like it. Verse 17. Or verse 18. Who concerning the truth have heard. Truth about what? Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Listen to me tonight. These are individuals who are talking about doctrine. They're talking about little matters like eternal life. And their conclusion is sad, you see. Yeah, that is, the resurrection already... It wasn't that they don't believe in the resurrection, but, you know, uh, shouldn't, it ha shouldn't it have happened already if it was going to happen? And particularly one of the topics, one of the matters at hand, is the second coming. And uh, not only the second coming, but Christ coming for his saints, which are two separate issues, separate separate uh, circumstances. The second coming, where Jesus comes in the cloud and calls up the saints. And these are individuals saying it already happened. How different is that from the fad of today, where individuals are debating when it will happen, when the Bible lays out plainly that the next event on God's calendar is for the Lord Jesus to come in the sky and call up his saints. It's the exact same thing. And the folks that are blah, 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 running their mouths all over the internet and all over in the different churches and picking fights with other believers are a cankering, festering sore. And they're exactly, precisely the people that uh, Paul is talking about. 
And they have the same attitudes too. And here's the result of their subversive conversation. The Bible says they overthrow the faith of some. These individuals I have seen get people out of church, not people in church. They pick individuals who want to come into churches and fight and argue and debate. And where do they end up? Well, they don't end up coming anymore. They go to their YouTube person that they follow, and then after they follow them for a while, then they end up just out and away and out of the faith. And Paul warns Timothy, deal with these guys. Deal with these guys. Hey, their ramifications of them is that they overthrow the faith of some. Now, thankfully, there are thinking people in the church. And uh, the conclusion about this, there's, there's some other things that are said there, and I recommend you read them for sake of time tonight. We cannot. But in verse 21, the Bible says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, speaking of being vessels of honor, and, and, uh, and uh, he says, He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the Master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Purge himself of what? Hymenius and uh, Philetus. I said Alexander, but it's Philetus. It was a terrible misquote. Uh, now, there's another problem in the church. Uh, verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Sometime recently, a young person, a person who was young in the faith asked me if they could debate me about the rapture and about, um, oh, I'm trying to remember a couple of other matters, a couple about Jews, about Jews and whether or not, you know, the Jews today are fake Jews and whether or not the church is Israel. They've been saved a couple of months at that time. Let me ask you a question. If you've been saved and studying the Scripture for 9 to 36 years, what's a guy that's been saved a month or two going to be able to debate with you about? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm not just trying to say people can't grow it and astronomical rate and an abnormal rate. But the reality is somebody who's newly saved wanting to debate Bible doctrine is, an, is a fool. You're a fool. When you're at a growing learning stage and you want to be in an arguing stage, uh, Paul told Timothy, avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Avoid. I'm sorry, I don't have a, I don't have a smart answer for a stupid question. Did you hear me? There are stupid questions. Ever heard somebody say, you know, there are no bad questions? Well, there may not be bad questions, but there are stupid ones. By the way, stupid, guys, is not a word that's befitting of anyone except for pastors. You have to be a pastor before it's a part of, proper part of your vocabulary. That's what my wife said. So I asked her about it if you don't agree with me. She says it should not be said, but I know the pastor's allowed to say it, so I think that's what she meant. <laughs> Foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Foolish and unlearned questions. What's a foolish question or an unlearned question? Well, a fool doesn't know what a good question is. Right? I mean, he may hit upon one by accident, but he doesn't know it because he's foolish. So foolish comes from somebody who's a fool. And it's sort of one defines the other, if you will. It's almost a circular definition. And then unlearned questions avoid. Unlearned questions. You, know, you can't argue with somebody that doesn't have some basic knowledge. You are trying to talk to somebody about whether or not there's, uh, you know, you want, to, you want to show them what the Bible says about God and they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't believe the Bible is God's Word. Well, I'm sorry, we can't really have much of very, very much of a discussion about the Bible if we can't even agree on what it is. If it isn't what it claims to be, uh, then we don't have a foundation or a premise. And, you know, I don't know how many people have told me the Bible has mistakes in it. And I've asked them, well, how often do you read it? And uh, they'll tell you, well, I've read it. And I say, okay, well, let's just discuss some of the content. Um, as far as books go, it's uh, fairly voluminous, I guess. It's a pretty good-sized book. How many of y'all read books like about this thing? All of us do, right? How much time it takes? It usually takes me, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm picking up a little at a time, it takes me a couple weeks to get through a book like this. Mm -hmm. A book this thick. It takes me a couple weeks. Uh, I read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, and it's probably about this thick, maybe about that big. Uh, it's about once a year. I try to read it once a year, you know, just because I want to remind myself of some things that I don't ever want to see happen in the world again. I just kind of want to know what precipitated those, those actions, and, I, and it's a help to me to read it. 
Now, if you were to ask me, have you ever read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich? I'd say yes. You ask me, you remember everything in it? No, but if you want to, you know, if you want to refresh my memory, I could probably discuss anything in it because I've read it quite a few times. So you know how many people that say they've read this book and you couldn't refresh their memory about anything in it? Because honestly, they never have read it. Now, they may own one, or they may know someone who owned one, or somebody might have told them something about it. But what it really comes down to, a guy, uh, i trying to think, Anthony, was it you and I that had the guy tell us a couple of months ago, I think it was you and I, that had a guy honestly tell us he hadn't read the Bible, but that some people had told him it had mistakes in it. And he was at least honest about that. He was said he was an agnostic, but he kind of, you know, backed off of that. And he actually took a Genesis, John, and Romans from us and said he'd read that. I said, well, you're not really honest about not knowing whether there's a God or not if you've never even read the book that tells you who he is. And he was actually honest enough to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll read the Genesis, John, and Romans, at least read some of it. But uh, he hadn't read. He had never read uh, the Bible, and he had actually said, well, you know what, I, I've just heard about mistakes in it. If you think the Bible has mistakes in it, I promise you've never read it. You've never read it. You're not being honest. and You can't really have much of a discussion with someone. That's a for instance. Uh, these... These foolish and unlearned questions, though, uh, they gender strifes. One time I did this. One time I picked a fight between two people. Um, I think it was uh, it was Charlie and uh, Alex and Chris. You remember this, Charlie, when I started a, an argument between you and Alex and Chris? <laughs> yeah. This is funny. What I asked? What was the question I asked? <laughs> I asked you it, first, right? Yeah. Yeah. If uh, you guys got to hear this. Basically. But if I were a dad and I had a daughter, like, would I let Chris marry her? Yeah, would, would, would you let Chris marry your daughter? That's why I asked Charlie. Charlie, would you let Chris marry your daughter? And Charlie gave an honest answer for it, and I mean, Chris got mad. I mean, he got really mad. And I asked Alex the question, and Alex said, well, it depends on the daughter. <laughs> that was his answer. You know, it kind of depends on what she's like, too. You know, but anyway, Charlie, I mean, Charlie was just a well. Charlie answered. That was a stupid question. You should have never answered it. Man, that got you in a lot of trouble, didn't you, Charlie? Answering that question. Foolish questions which engender strife. It's a good example of it, isn't it? Good illustration. Shame on you, Pastor, for doing that. It sure was fun. Made memories. But <laughs> <laughs> the reality of it is, I mean, it was tense in the truck. I mean, it was a couple hour long angry conversation because Charlie would not let him marry his hypothetical daughter. <laughs> Charlie's like, well, Chris, you'd have to change this and this and this. You know, Charlie's always giving the honest answer. Tell him all his problems and everything. And, you know, this is why I won't let you marry my non-existent daughter, okay? <laughs> he should have said, I don't have a daughter, so I'm not going to worry about it. That would have been the best answer. But no, he tried to answer a stupid question. And there's just no good answer for a stupid question, is there? That doesn't make me look very good being the one that uh, gendered the strife. But the Bible says in verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. Patient. Okay, so there uh, are characteristics that come from a servant of the Lord. And Timothy is told that answering stupid questions is not conducive to being able to teach people. Sometimes we as believers honestly need to have enough wisdom to say that's a foolish and unlearned question. I'm getting better at it. I, I could probably come up with maybe 20 instances if I thought hard and if my memory was working that day uh, of having actually avoided questions in the last couple of years and just said, you know, I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, a guy called me about some theological trends and he wanted to interview me about it. And I just told him, I'm not going to interview about you about that because of the nature of of the people that are off on those doctrines. I said, I just don't want to even get caught up in those. I just don't even want to be responding to those guys. I just don't want to be involved in it because uh, there's just nothing to gain by it. They're not looking for answers. They're, they're uh, just looking to debate. They're not looking to find out truth. And, and uh, all it's going to do is put me on a scene where I won't be able to minister in my church. I'll be yelling at, you know, responding to people that are yelling out on the Internet. And I, I don't have an internet ministry. I have a local church ministry. An internet ministry may be supplemental to that or I incidental to it. But that isn't, that isn't what I'm called to do. And so that's good advice. Here's another problem. Uh, in chapter 3, verse uh, 1, This know also that in last days perilous times shall come. And here's the, the... For men shall be lovers of them their own selves, covetous boasters, 
proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, and goes on and on uh, to talk about these individuals. Then notice verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. <laughs> now, you ever just follow the train of thought? You look at the description of these people. They're, they, they're selfish. They love their own selves. They're covetous. They want things God doesn't want for them. They're boasters. They're proud. They're blasphemers. They disobey their parents. They're unthankful. They're unholy. They have. They don't have natural affection. Uh, they, they don't have a love of the... You know what natural affection is for believers? It's love of the brethren. It's love of your family. I don't know how many believers that I've known have gotten saved said, you know, before I was saved, I didn't love anybody, but after I was saved, I loved everybody. That's natural affection for a believer. Uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And then verse 5 says, having a form of godliness. In other words... Having a form of godliness, it's, it's obviously not the actual structure, but, but made to look godly. It's incredible how... Mrs. Dollins, it's, it's uh, 6.53. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I hear everything. All right. Uh, <laughs> the, the having a form of godliness means looks godly to appearance, but we just describe what the person is. Is that a godly person? Is there anything like godliness in that? Nothing like it. It is not believers that their fruits tell of them. It's false teachers. The Bible says about false teachers, by their fruits you shall know them. All you have to do is just... How, how do they get along with their parents? Well, you know, they, you got to understand, their parents never love and wish. No. Natural affection, you love your parents no matter what they are like. That's actually the truth. It isn't, well, my parents are perfect, so I reciprocate. A person who disrespects or dishonors their parents is a person who's not godly. And you could just go down the, the laundry list here and look at unthankful, always griping, always complaining, always mad because the circumstances in their life are just not fair, they're not just, they're not treated equally. Unthankful. Unholy. But they look godly, and that's a problem. And uh, here's the illustration of the problem. Now as Janus and Jamrus withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Remember Janus and Jamrus, right? The yeah. people that didn't believe that Moses was qualified? Yeah. And uh, how, how, are they, how are they received by the general population? They got a following, didn't they? I mean, the things they said about Moses, people were like, well, I can see why you'd say that. Yeah. Better be careful. Better look out, better be careful when someone who pretends to be godly <laughs> withstands God's man. And by the way, I'm not equating Moses to the pastor in the local church. I believe in honoring uh, and, and uh, having respect for pastors and so forth, but I think that's been taken to another level sometimes where uh, tyranny or bad behavior is condoned because of a title. And you understand, Moses didn't just have a title. Who, who told Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? God did. God did. You better watch out when God puts someone somewhere withstanding a person who God is for. And these individuals are not afraid of God. It's not just Moses that they're withstanding. They, so do these also resist the truth, the Bible says, and men of corrupt minds and reprobate. And uh, we're told in verse 13... Uh, okay, I'm sorry. So let's look at the let's look at the the affliction, or I mean, it's not the affliction. Let's look at the solution or the mindset to deal with it. First of all, verse ten: Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. It's interesting that Paul's talking about Moses, and then he brings himself into it. Why? Well, because individuals actually factually were withstanding Paul the same way that Moses was withstood. He said, everybody in Ephesus, they've all turned against me. And the same was true with many of the folks at Philippi. Uh, you read Paul's letters, his prison epistles, and you'll see that his chain and his bondage caused many of the brethren to wax bold, speaking against him, withstanding him, and actually opposing him. Who made Paul an apostle? 
Jesus did. The Lord Jesus Christ did. The Lord Jesus Christ. He withstand Paul, who he was standing. And here Paul actually mentions, okay, see, Janus and Jambres did this to Moses, and then he mentions, and this is, you know, in kind, what's happening to me. And here's the thing that, that Paul mentions for his defense. How did Moses handle it when he was, he, when his calling and right to lead the children of Israel was challenged? What did he do? Right out to God. He cried out to God, and who defended Moses? The Lord. God did. God did. He bowed down. Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, in verse 10, Paul just simply says, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. So these are places where Timothy was aware, and he actually saw what Paul went through. He said, What persecutions I endured. But then notice this, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Let me help you with something this evening. Moses cried out to God, and Paul uh, mentioned the fact that I was in these circumstances, and uh, who was it that delivered me? Did I deliver myself? No, I did not. God delivered me. And so let God defend you. That's what Paul's saying is the solution. You'll have people that will withstand the truth. They'll argue, and they'll actually stand against the person who proclaims the truth. That was Paul in this instance. And Paul's response was, well, God takes care of that. And then in verse 12, he reminds them that it's normal to be persecuted. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then he says, oh, and here's another problem. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, one of the problems with deceptive people is when they get off, they tend to follow people that are off. And it's just like, well, what's going to be next? What next? I've uh, candidly asked that of people that I've known in the past who tend to have a propensity to follow false doctrine or false teaching. And when they become false teachers, uh, I will just ask them, what's the latest? <laughs> what's the latest? I've asked that. I can think of a couple people I've asked that of. And they'll, they'll actually tell me, well, you know, I've been looking at whether or not, you know, everybody's always believed this. And everybody thinks that this is what the Bible teaches. But, you know, I've discovered, you know, this person, and they'll tell about a person who wrote a book somewhere who's, you know, teaching something, and they come up with a new doctrine. Come up with something new, and it's the latest. It's the greatest, and it's the thing that just always chasing that new thing that gets them attention, I believe is the motivation behind it. And uh, in the solution to that, Paul said in verse 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul said, you just keep right on along. Don't you get off on a tangent. Don't go off responding. Don't waste your time with foolish and unlearned questions. You just keep on trucking. Now, friend, let me uh, conclude this evening by saying this. The gospel is very, very simple. Remember that Christ Jesus of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Can I share the gospel with you tonight? Christ Jesus of the seed of David was raised from the dead. And you know what happens when the gospel's preached? People get saved. Complicated gospels don't save. The gospel saves. Just the gospel. Just the gospel saves. And you can tell them about Jesus. You don't know who Jesus is? He's God's Son. He was sinless. And He died on the cross for sin. Not sin He committed, but sin that we've committed. The Bible says all sin that comes short of the glory of God. Jesus died for your sin, but the Bible says He also died for the sins of the whole world. The whole world's not going to heaven. What makes the difference between someone who's going to heaven and someone who isn't? Believe, Believe in Jesus. The Bible says, As many as received Him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Now, do you think that maybe, do you think that maybe you need to consider whether or not you need to receive Jesus as your Savior? And you know, just asking that simple, you say, Pastor, you know the gospel. I mean, there's just so much more about that. They need to know, da, da, da. and you can just add and add and add things. You can't possibly add enough things that people can learn about God that a person who, before they get saved, can know. But the Holy Spirit of God can take simple words and a simple message and take the power of the gospel, and He can save lives, and I've seen it happen time and again. Or you can just spend all your time arguing with a bunch of nonsense, foolish, and unlearned questions. And uh, you can deal with strife, and you can spend your time trying to defend yourself from people that want to attack you. Uh, and it's, that's all a waste of time. Solution? Solution? Preach the gospel. Paul said, just remember where you, where you came from. Remember where you're going. 
and to just stick it out. Uh, I don't know how many times I used to hear, whenever you'd hear about somebody getting saved, I remember just, you know, man, you know, we went, had a bunch of people, we had 30 people come on soul winning on Saturday, and man, we had we had, we had had 20-some people that got saved. Well, that's great. You know, is anyone discipling them? How many of y'all ever heard that? Well, that's great. You know, what are y'all going to do to disciple them? I've never met a person who's concerned about people being saved who isn't concerned about them growing. That's just, that, that, that whole question is just a misnomer. It's just a, it's just a false accusation. It just wants to start off in an argument that's all about, you know, people aren't really getting saved, or if they are getting saved, you're not doing the right thing by just preaching the gospel. You need, they just want to argue with you about stuff. How in the world can someone hear that souls are saved, that souls come to Jesus Christ, and not rejoice about it? Amen. What's wrong with that picture? You say, Pastor, well, some people aren't doing a good job preaching the gospel. Were you there? <laughs> Did you hear what happened? Uh, I wonder how good a job the person who led me to Jesus did sometimes. He was a nutcase. He was a nut job. Glenn Peathers is his name. He's still alive. He'll probably watch me on YouTube saying this someday. But uh, I mean, he used to he used to go around town yelling stuff on a megaphone. And he stayed at our night one at our house one night, and uh, he challenged me about being lost. And uh, you know something? I'm pretty sure. I, I my dad called him up. He'd gotten my dad got in contact with him about ten years ago. I hadn't heard from him in years and years. And I was with my dad in Kansas, and my dad said, "Oh, I've got his cell number. Let's call him see if he answers." And we called. and We talked about how he got saved. And I thought, man, that guy's a nut job. You know, just, just talking to him. But he loves the Lord. And I'll tell you what, he probably has seen thousands upon thousands of people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because he knows the gospel simple and he simply preaches it. And I'm one of the people that got saved by it. I mean, it's just as simple as Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You're a sinner and you need to be born again. Would you like to be born again? No, I, I'm sure I had some ancillary information. I learned some things already at four years old from going to church and I knew some things about God and about Jesus but he's the one that challenged me that I needed to receive Jesus as my Savior and I did <laughs> all through my high school years I had to sit under a lot of different preachers who tried to convince me that being saved is much more complicated than simply trusting Jesus but my friend it isn't it isn't you can get caught up in that whole thing or you can come to Jesus you can preach the gospel or you can argue about the gospel. I notice people argue about the gospel aren't preaching it as much. I didn't say they're not preaching it at all because somebody may be. I just haven't seen it. They just want to argue, 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 argue. Bicker, bicker, bicker about things. And uh, Paul told Timothy, don't do that. You know what the truth is. You know how to preach the truth. And go ahead. So you're looking at me tonight and you're saying, Pastor, you know, you're, I think you're oversimplifying the gospel. I hope you're not preaching, you know, the gospel and are wrong to people. Well, you all ever heard me preach the gospel? You think I know what the gospel is? I mean, honestly, do you? I, think I, I can quote John 3 to you. That's the gospel, isn't it? I think I know what the gospel is. So you say, well, it sounds like you're really preaching it simply. I, say, I wish I could preach it more simply. I do. You know, and uh, the same people... <laughs> That would say, well, you know what, uh, you know that, that simple faith, that simple believing, uh, gospel, you know, I, you know, you think I'm not saved? That's what I believed, a simple gospel. I don't think you're smart enough to believe the complicated one. <coughs> That's what I say. If I were going to argue with a foolish and unlearned <laughs> question. That's not nice, is it? Paul would have said that, okay? He would have said you're a cankering sore. And, uh... <laughs> All right, did, did I make my point this evening? Sometimes we're so worried about, you know, catering to the disingenuous question, which is, why aren't you nice? When the real question is, do you know the gospel? So we're supposed to be talking about the gospel, we're not supposed to be talking about my temperament. But doesn't that become the doesn't that become the issue? Now, as a person who wants to talk about temperament, are they being honest? No. Not really. I, I, I tell you, if we could just retire retire the statement, it isn't what you said, it's how you said it. If we could just retire that, 
once and for all and say, well, you know what, I, I think that what you say and the truth or veracity of it actually bears a great deal of importance. I wish, I wish you were uh, cuter when you said it or more handsome or you knew how to say things in a more palatable manner. That would be great. But actually, you know, the fact of the matter is I think I'm at a stage in life where I don't really care how you say it. I want the truth. I'd rather hear people say, I take the truth in whatsoever uh, bladder it's served. And I don't care if it's palatable or not, I'll swallow it. Amen. <laughs> give us a church like that. Give us a, give us a generation like that that says, I don't care how hard it is to swallow, if it's the truth, I'll, I'll take it. Because I want the truth. Now you say, Pastor, you don't seem very nice. Well, it's not nice you to think that about me, so think about that. Father, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your word and for the help that we get from Paul and Timothy about the problems in the church. And Lord, it just seems so parallel to many things we run into today. And I pray that you'd help us to have the wisdom and, uh, Lord, the, the courage to deal with things as they come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.